On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with Robert Mays about his commentary, Esquire article on Eben Alexander Distorts the Facts. Tell us what the rainbow thing is all about, and then tell us what you found out. In the book, on Sunday morning, according to the story that uh, Dr. Alexander wrote, his sister Phyllis and his mother Betty um, were coming into the hospital and saw a perfect rainbow, and they felt that this was a sign. Luke Dittrich then asked the meteorologist whether there could have been a rainbow then, and the meteorologist said, well, the day was clear, so there couldn't have been. And I said, well, wait a minute. Two people said they saw it. So I called Phyllis Alexander, and she said, definitely, we saw a rainbow. Mother Betty uh, remarked that it was a perfect rainbow. They talked about it. And just to add a little tidbit that you talk about in your article that I thought was great and is real, the real kind of journalism we would have liked to have gotten from Esquire is, so you not only talked to these eyewitnesses, which he did not, but they also had evidence because it was such a spectacular event that they had written an email. They had email documentation that when they came away that day from the hospital, they wrote someone an email and said, wow, there's this great rainbow. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, we're going to take another look at the Eben Alexander proof of heaven controversy that stirred up. And before we get started, I wanted to step back and say that this, if you've been following this show, is a reoccurring theme, and that is the rather obvious imbalance there is in the scientific media, and really, I guess you could say the serious media, if you get past the, the Oprah's and the feel-good people. If you get down to the serious media, there's a real bias against anything that links to the spiritual in a scientific way. So, the near-death experience science that we talk so much about on this show anything paranormal or parapsychology, anything like that, you'll find, as we've demonstrated over and over again on this show, not only a bias, but a willingness to misrepresent and distort science if it achieves the desired end. And the desired end in this case is clear. It is to prop up this idea that you are just your brain, nothing more that's what drives all this. And as crazy as that proposition is, and as ridiculous as that sounds, that someone would continue to promote that in face of all the evidence against it, that seems to be what we keep encountering on this show as we just sort through the facts. So with that, I think we can add this well done bit of research by an independent team, Robert and Suzanne Mays, who read the Esquire expose on Eben Alexander's Proof of Heaven book and said, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. Let me go do my own journalistic investigation. So here's my interview with Robert Mays and we can see what he's found. Today we welcome Robert Mays to Skeptico. Robert, along with his wife, Suzanne, have been longtime researchers in near-death experience and consciousness studies they published quite a few papers and have done presentations for both the International Association of Near-Death Studies Conference and the well-known Science of Consciousness Conference in Tucson, Arizona. So anyone who's familiar with this field very well might have bumped into the work of these two very interesting and excellent near-death experience researchers. They're here today to talk about a new article they just published titled, Esquire article on Eben Alexander distorts the facts, in which they tell us about their investigation into the near-death experience account of Harvard neurosurgeon Eben Alexander, who last year published a blockbuster bestseller book titled Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Near-Death Experience and Journey into the Afterlife. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Robert Mays. Robert, thanks so much for joining me today on Skeptico. Yes, thank you. Glad to be here. Well, great. You know, before we dive into this article that you've published on Dr. Eben Alexander's case and then the book and the controversy that's stirred up around that, 
I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about the research that you and Suzanne have done. You know, in checking out your website, there's a lot of stuff that you guys have published in this field. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we have a a basic theory based on the near-death experience uh, that the mind consciousness, a person's consciousness, separates from the body in a near-death experience and uh, operates independently of it. And and then, of course, at the end of the near-death experience, rejoins the body. This isn't something that you've just kind of dreamt up or anything. It's just a compilation of a lot of research and you just kind of present your case. And I think what I've seen, you do a very fair job of saying, hey, doesn't the evidence point there? You do some great stuff on the phantom limb phenomena, which is a well-known medical phenomena that when an amputee loses an arm or a leg, they can still have sensations down there. And and you question in a very scientific, scholarly way, whether or not some research points to that as being further evidence of this separation between consciousness and and brain function, uh, right? Right, exactly. Uh, the, the phantom limbs, they are a region uh, where the limb was that still has, a, it's a region of consciousness. So, so we call that a, a mind limb. That's one of the pieces of evidence that we use. Also, uh, a lot of neurological evidence that, that we use uh, because the, if you look at neurological phenomena from the point of view of, well, could this be a mind and a brain? operating, then uh, a lot of things start to make a lot of sense. Uh, For example, uh, uh, Benjamin Libet did quite a number of studies uh, where he showed that um, mental events become conscious only when there's a sufficient electrical brain activity. Uh, Otherwise, they remain subliminal. And, And, of course, neuroscientists know that, but uh, if you think about, well, it requires a certain amount of electrical activity for there to be formed the consciousness in, in the mind, then that makes, that makes uh, a lot of sense. So, so we use both uh, neurological phenomena, uh, phantom limb phenomena, and uh, the NDE phenomena. One of the reasons that I even brought up the broad research that you've done into consciousness and near-death studies is that I, I think that plays an important part into this story we're about to tell about Dr. Evan Alexander, and that is that you have done near-death experience research. You've read many of the dozens and dozens of scholarly books, hundreds of papers. You've met a lot of these people at conferences, interacted with them on a professional basis. I guess the reason I keep hounding on that is I want to go back a little bit because I had a chance to interview Dr. Eben Alexander in November of 2011, before he had written the book. And I thank the listeners of Skeptica who alerted me to this guy, said, hey, here's this guy, neurosurgeon from Harvard, had this rather incredible near-death experience. You think you should talk to him? I was like, wow, this is great. But from the beginning, my thought was, hey, great, another fantastic near-death experience account. I certainly didn't take it as being that out of the ordinary or unusual. So I guess I was surprised when the book came out a year later and there was just this backlash against Alexander as if this was the first near-death experience account that had ever come out or as if there wasn't a substantial body of research to back up the reality of this phenomena. And I kind of felt from the beginning that it was much more of a focus on attacking this one person than attacking the larger body of near-death experience research. Did you have any similar thoughts to that, Robert? Did you see it differently when his book first came out? This is a kind of pattern, I think, that skeptics have. They will take the particular uh, phenomenon and say, well, that's just an anecdote. And they don't look at the whole picture of uh, near-death experience research and see that there are patterns. Uh, I mean, this happens all the time when, when people claim that, you know, some sort of neurological phenomenon uh, explains near-death experiences. Because I want to take it back kind of one step further, because when Eben Alexander comes out with this book, before actually the book even comes out, there was a Newsweek magazine article, and he was on the cover of it. And I think... That really riled up 
the scientific, atheistic uh, mainstream media, but maybe for a reason that is somewhat justified, because let, let's also be real, too. You know, here's a guy in Evan Alexander who was right guy at the right place, has this amazing story, gets this really substantial book deal. And you can just imagine, you know, they bring him in and they say, OK, buddy, here it is. Here's your editor. Here's your marketing guy. Here's your media guy. We're going to get you on the Today Show, all that other stuff. And by the way, here's the title of your book, Proof of Heaven, you know, which really kind of sticks it to the atheists, right? The, the scientific folks are fighting this religious culture war. And here's a guy coming out with a book titled Proof of Heaven. You got to know, fairly or unfairly, they felt a pretty strong need to strike back. And they did it in the old time-tested way of if you can't attack the evidence, you know, attack the person. And that's what I think is going on here. But I think there was, I think that title, Proof of Heaven, did kind of rile those folks more than, than even usual in this case. Yes, I agree with that. Well, then let, let's go ahead and, and go forward. W one additional point I guess I wanted to bring up on that is because when the book did come out, one of the first guys who jumped forward and really led this charge of attack from the science crowd, atheist crowd, was Sam Harris. And we I actually had an email exchange with Dr. Harris that I think is pretty revealing because he came out and immediately <laughs> said, said I, and I don't even know how he could kind of back this up, but he did. He wrote this scathing review and basically challenged Alexander's integrity. To your point, Robert, it's the kind of talking points thing. He gets those talking points out there that we will see repeated over and over again. He had claims that his account wasn't factual. He's basically calling him a liar. And he does all this before the book is even published. So I sent an email to Dr. Alexander, and he was nice enough to respond. And I wanted to read for you the response that Dr. Alexander published, because I think it also plays into the next part of this story that we're going to get into, which is the article that you and Suzanne wrote, where you really investigated these claims further. But here's what Dr. Alexander wrote in response to Sam Harris's opening salvo in this battle of whether or not this near-death experience account is really factual or not. He writes, Of course it was premature for Sam Harris to speak out based on the Newsweek article. He needs to at least read the book if he wants to avoid making embarrassing statements that he later regrets. A nice way of saying he's totally full of crap, but anyways, he continues, and here's the medical part that I think plays into the rest of the story we want to talk about. The severity of my meningitis and its complete resistance to therapy for a week should have eliminated all but the most rudimentary of conscious experiences. And then he goes on to list a bunch of medical data that I don't really know a lot about, but I think other people in the medical profession would understand. He talks about his white blood count being extremely low. He talks about bands of toxic granulations being at a level that is very, very worrisome. And in particular, he talks about his glucose level being extremely low, a 1.0, when it's normally in the 60 to 80 range, and even in a severe meningitis, drops down to a 20. So I will publish this. I've published it once before, but I'll include it in this show so that people who do want some of these medical facts can dig into it. Here's some of the other points that he makes that I think are important. This is, again, Dr. Alexander responding to Sam Harris a couple months before this whole Esquire thing blows up. And he says, going from symptom onset that is the first symptoms he had of this spinal meningitis, to coma within three hours is a very dire prognostic sign. And he was, as we'll get to in a minute, in coma 
when he he was in and out of coma when he was first admitted to the hospital. So that is factual, and it's confirmed by the medical records. I think he was in coma continuously. We'll get into that. I, I think the, the terms there, the medical terms, lose meaning in, to a certain extent because what he's really saying and what all the medical experts are saying consistently is that he was in a state of severely compromised mental brain functioning throughout. That should just not even be controversial. So when we start spinning things, coma, induced coma, all that, we'll get to that. But here is a guy who's kind of laying out some medical facts, and he says that his state would be 90% mortality rate from the very beginning, given this situation that he has, that it came on so quickly. And then he goes on to say directly to Sam Harris, no physician who knows anything about meningitis will just blow off the fact that I was deathly ill in every sense of the word and that my neocortex was absolutely hammered. He goes on to say at the end, my physicians and their consultants at University of Virginia, Wake Forest, Duke, Harvard, Stanford, and beyond were astonished that I recovered, which again, I think, as we'll get to, is backed up in the article that you wrote, which let's get to, because on July 2nd of 2013, this is seven, eight months after the book has become a bestseller, sold two million copies, I received this email from Esquire's editor-in-chief, David Granger. He writes, This morning we published an important article by Luke Dietrich about Dr. Eben Alexander, the author of Proof of Heaven, which has been one of the great successes in book publishing this year. The premise of the book was irresistible. A man of science, neurosurgeon, is attacked by a rare disease that sends him into a coma, indeed causes his brain to cease functioning. While he's incapacitated, he has a vivid experience of afterlife. Finally, after being restored to health, he recreates his journey in book form. We had some questions, the editor from Esquire writes. We asked contributing editor Luke Dietrich, who's working on a book about neuroscience, what he thought of the science of Alexander's book. Dietrich spent several months both looking into Alexander's medical and scientific background and researching the fact-based claims the book makes. What he's revealed is a series of omissions, contradictions, and inaccuracies in Alexander's book that cast fresh light on its remarkable tale. So, there we have it. This article from Esquire in July of 2013 just created a firestorm. The folks in the scientific atheistic community just ran with this. Many had not read the article. It was behind a paywall, but that's their business. But many had not re- had read it. They just kind of ran with it. This is great. We've kind of, as you said earlier, we've knocked down this guy who everyone is so excited about his near-death experience. And then last week, that is August 15th of 2013, you, Robert and Suzanne, published an article on the International Association for Near-Death Studies website. And I want to get into now that article, but I want to start with the conclusion that you write in that article. Here's what you write, you and Suzanne. The Dietrich article, that is the article published in Esquire, is shoddy and irresponsible journalism. Shoddy because of Luke Dietrich's and his Esquire editor's evident failures. And then you list out some of those failures that I want to talk about. You say that they fail to consider alternative explanations. They fail to check with cited witnesses. Extremely important. Most importantly, they fail to check with medical experts on many of the assertions that they're making. And again, right up there with the most important, they fail to check on the crucial testimony that they get that this whole thing hinges on, and they don't even bother to see whether they really got that right. So with that very lengthy introduction, and I appreciate you just kind of standing by, I can only imagine all the things you have to say, because you've done fantastic research into this case. But with that as an introduction, 
Can you tell us how this unfolded for you, how you became interested in investigating this Esquire article and how all that started? Well, uh, I usually write news articles for our website, the IAMS website, and uh, this is obviously one that needs to be written up and uh, analyzed. Uh, and if there's, uh, if there are things that the uh, that are in the news article that I'm writing about that need further investigation, like this doesn't make sense, uh, uh, this doesn't seem right, uh, then I go and do whatever investigation I can. So I read uh, Luke Dietrich's article very carefully and found that the key criticism was that the coma was really not a meningitis-induced coma, but was really a chemically-induced coma, medically-induced coma, and that he really wasn't uh, in a coma. Uh, he was in and out of a coma. He was, in fact, what was quoted, Dr. Potter was quoted as saying, conscious but delirious. Let's introduce who is, who is Dr. Laura Potter. Uh, Dr. Potter uh, was the uh, ER physician when Eben Alexander was brought in uh, on that Monday morning. And so she was in charge of, of treating him initially, doing the initial uh, diagnostic tests and so on. Okay, and she's featured very prominently in the Esquire article as the medical expert. Real quickly, and I want you to go on with your story. Who is Dr. Scott Wade? Uh, he apparently is the, is the lead physician. Um, He's an infectious disease specialist, right? of course you would want uh, with me uh, bacterial meningitis. And the you just said an important word. He's the lead physician, okay? So right. not to discredit or demean in any way the important role that the ER physician, Dr. Laura Potter, played, but there's other medical experts in this case that we'll hear about here today, which you certainly didn't hear in the Esquire article. But continue. You were suspicious, as I was, and, and that... that Hey, wait a minute. What are they saying? The, the guy had severe men spinal meningitis, you know, E. coli bacteria. Well, what is this idea that he wasn't, he wasn't really that, that, that ill? So continue from there. So I, I, I say, well, con how could she have said he was conscious but delirious given all of the medical facts that were, you know, present uh, on the Skeptico website and uh, at other times that uh, Eben Alexander has uh, Presented this, and he and so I I called uh, the hospital and asked to speak to do Dr. Potter and uh, left a message on her voicemail and didn't get a response. I I, I figured that what I had said a, a few hours later wasn't complete, so I I called again and left another message. Um, this time I got a secretary I think uh, who took the message and said she would definitely want to get that to. to Dr. Potter, but I didn't hear anything at all. And uh, over the weekend, um, I called. You know, I was worried about. You're know, interested in this. You know, how could there be no rainbow on um, Sunday morning uh, when the meteorologist said it was clear? Okay, because let, let's introduce that again too. Because the the Dietrich article, anyone, you have to read it. You have to read it because it's. It's extremely well crafted. Let's give him that, you know. And he builds this case with the facts that he has, but he, he really builds this whole thing around this guy's a liar. That's the story, and he approaches it from a number of different angles, some of which are really substantive to the story, like the coma thing, and these other things that he just kind of picks at, but they do kind of stick in your mind as you're reading the article, like the rainbow thing. Tell us what the, the rainbow thing is all about, and then tell us what you found out. Well, uh, in the book, uh, on Sunday morning, according to the story that uh, Dr. Alexander wrote, um, his sister Phyllis and his mother Betty um, were coming into the hospital and saw a perfect rainbow, and they felt that this was a sign. Dietrich took this as saying, well, heaven itself was heralding uh, Evan Alexander's return. And, uh, and then Luke Dietrich then said, uh, asked the meteorologist 
whether there could have been a rainbow then, and the meteorologist said, well, the day was clear, so there couldn't have been. And I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, somebody, two people said they, they saw it. So I called Phyllis Alexander, and she said, definitely, we saw a rainbow. Uh, it was a, uh, the mother Betty uh, uh, was remarked that it was a perfect rainbow. They talked about it, and then they went immediately up to uh, Eben's room, and there Eben was sitting up. So that was the time that he had recovered. And, and just to add a little tidbit that you talk about in your article that I thought was great, and it's real, the real kind of journalism we would have liked to have gotten from Esquire is, so you not only talked to these eyewitnesses, which he did not, he just went on some meteorological report, but they also had evidence because it was such a spectacular event that they had written an email, and I forget who, whether it was the sister or whatever, but they had email documentation that when they came away that day from the hospital, they wrote someone an email and said, wow, there's this great rainbow. So, I mean, that's... Right. So later, later that day, uh, uh, Phyllis said that she had written to the, the people, she's from Boston, and she had friends in Boston who were praying for Evan. Uh, she had uh, written them saying... Evan has recovered, and and we saw I, I saw a, a beautiful rainbow uh, as I was coming into the hospital. Uh, so that's uh, so she said, uh, you know, there's there's that documentation as well. So Luke Dietrich's argument there is uh, empty. It's shoddy journalism. If you're trying to debunk something, which I've run across so many times, that's one thing. You're a debunker. You're just out there, you know, just throwing whatever you can against the wall and seeing what sticks. But if you're Esquire, who still has some kind of legitimacy as a journalistic enterprise, you, you, you have to do more than this. You have to talk to witnesses. You have to get their side of it. I, I, and, and I think this lays a pattern for what we're about to, what else we're about to talk about. So uh, the other point you make right after this in your article is this other fact that becomes controversial, and that's Dr. Alexander calls out, oh, my God, and that becomes a, 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 obviously a, an important part of the story. Dietrich seeks to shoot that down. Tell us about that, Robert. Dietrich is, is saying that, uh, according to Dr. Potter, he couldn't have uh, yelled that out because, it, and it, in the book it says right before he's leaving, to go, being taken from the emergency room to the ICU, he yelled out, uh, God help me. And uh, it couldn't have happened because he was intubated at that time. Uh, and, in fact, he had been intubated for about an hour before he was taken up to MICU. And so the, um, that couldn't have happened. Well, there were two witnesses, uh, Holly Alexander, Evan's wife, and uh, Michael Sullivan, who is um, an Episcopal minister who is their neighbor. And um, they were both in the ER at the time, so I called Holly and said, um, you know, it took a while to get a hold of her, and I had to have some help from, from uh, Phyllis, Phyllis. But um, I talked with her, and, and she said, yes, he did say, he did say that. In fact, we, I was standing right outside the, the curtain. They had, uh, they had said, okay, everybody out because we have to do this test, uh, you know, this procedure. And so they were standing outside, uh, she and, and Mr. Sullivan, and uh, and and they both heard uh, uh, Evan say, "God help me," as he was struggling with the people who were trying to do this procedure, whatever it was, and uh, and and so they 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 went to the bedside, and and of course he was he was still struggling and was un still unconscious. So um, so there it is. Uh, uh, and of course that happened before the intubation. So. So the the embellishment that has happened here was for dramatic effect, apparently, that, oh, it had to be right before he's taken up to the ICU rather than sometime, you know, two hours before that in the ER. Right. And this is a, a minor detail that, you know, who knows how it got in there or the editor or whatever. It's it's really not important to the, to the story. And I can understand Dr. Potter uh, saying that if she's asked a certain way, which she was. Let's get back to that story, that part of the story, because it's crucial, crucial, crucial. It is really the point at which 
the whole article from Esquire shifts because he's kind of picking around at all these little things. And then he hits you with, hey, wait a minute. I talked to the ER physician and she has serious doubts about this guy's story. That's the the, the meme that you get from uh, Luke Dietrich is that L- Laura Potter is totally dissing this story and saying it couldn't have happened that way. And he wasn't really in a coma and he was delirious. And that's, he makes the case that that's probably how this story all came about in this, in this delirium that Alexander was having. So why don't you pick up from there, Robert, because you've said you've put a couple calls into Dr. Potter at this point in the story. You haven't heard back. What happens next? I received from members of the family copies of emails that they had been sending back and forth and uh, copies of portions, just snippets of emails. And in that was a statement that uh, Dr. Potter had made. Apparently, uh, I learned later, it was a statement that she had issued to a, a press organization, news organization, and um, and apparently they, that news organization did not use it. In any case, uh, that statement was uh, that she was misquoted and uh, taken out of context. And so I said, whoa, uh, this is really quite strange. Um, and that fact that she felt like her account was misrepresented, that she was much more of supportive of Alexander's story than it came out, and that she felt like the questions weren't fair is backed up by what you heard from the family, right? Because the family talks to Dr. Potter and she's kind of like apologizing and saying, gosh, I don't know how this happened. And that's what I took away from your article. Is that what you got from talking to the family? Yes. Basically, they said they repeated what Dr. Potter had in this statement. Uh, When when Dr. Potter finally... uh, communicated to me through the public relations person at the hospital. Uh, the public relations person said, Dr. Potter wants the statement that, that I was quoting in the article removed. And I said, fine. Uh, I, I was trying to, you know, I had contacted the public relations department because Dr. Potter hadn't responded yet. And, uh, and, I, and, and they didn't respond right away. I had to call them three times. And um, and finally, uh, Diane Riley uh, called me back and said uh, she had talked with Dr. Potter, and Dr. Potter doesn't want you to use that uh, statement that she had, do- doesn't want that quotation in there. But she still made that statement, and she did express that to the family. And I think I want to make it crystal clear here that we put the responsibility where it belongs and where you put it in your article. And that is for Luke Dietrich, who went out there with this piece of work that he did, to back up his claims. You don't talk to one person and then misrepresent him and not go back and say, hey, is this really what you said? You don't go and not talk to the lead physician, Dr. Scott Wade, who still stands by his report that there is no way this guy could have had a functioning brain and that the coma lasted virtually from the time that this thing onset till he was out. The, the responsibility for this is squarely on Esquire. And as you point out, I think it was you who said it, hey, at the very least, if you're Luke Dietrich and you think maybe you just made this little mistake by accident, great, publish your notes, publish your recordings with the doctor, with Dr. Laura Potter. Show us that you didn't twist this into a story to fit your predetermined goal, because all the other facts that you're bringing up would really paint that as the true story of what's going on here. Right. And, and basically, Dr. Potter expressed to the family that she had been misrepresented and that her words were taken out of context uh, by Luke Dietrich and that he had led her to say certain things. And in fact, uh, it was a little more than that. They said that he had, that she had expressed to them that he had forced her to say certain things. I didn't hear that from Dr. Potter, but that's what they say to me. It, it, it is it, as if he was leading her uh, in, in a way that uh, she had to come out and say, yes, conscious, but delirious. But that isn't really what 
is applying to to uh, Evan Alexander's case. At least that's my my guess, and uh, and that indeed uh, he was in a coma. And the que- the the question that Luke Dittrich says he posed to her, I don't think is the question he actually posed to her when she said yes, conscious but delirious. It would be very interesting to see what exactly happened in that interview and uh, and and just to understand um, what she was responding to. I think it would be more than interesting. I think it's absolutely his responsibility, given the damage that this article has done and sought to do from the beginning. There's an added level of response, journalistic responsibility to get your facts right. And these things being called into question this way demand that he really back up his claims. Yes, it's very interesting. Dr. Potter doesn't want to be, you know, involved in this anymore. She wants to, you know, let it go. We have to respect that. So you, you, we, can't, we can't go back to Dr. Potter, but we can, you know, if, if, uh, if Luke Dietrich did uh, record this, it would be interesting for the Esquire editors to look at what exactly is said. And, and maybe make that available. And, 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 and what, you know, what was the conversation that he had where Dr. Potter said, uh, yes, conscious but delirious? Because on that hinges everything of his claim that he wasn't in a, a bacterial meningitis induced coma, he was in a medically induced coma that he, they brought him out of periodically. Uh, because and, and of course he was flashing around, conscious quote conscious but delirious, and then they would put because he was flashing around he, he would be put back into the into the medically induced coma. No, he was he was out the whole time. Well, well that that whole scenario makes for an extremely terrible explanation for this near death experience, and it goes back to the very first thing you said here, Robert, and that's that. We've seen this, if you've been around this field for a long time, you've seen this over and over again. It's the divide and conquer. Oh, I can explain that near-death experience this way. Oh, I can explain that near-death experience a completely different way that contradicts the first way, but now I've handled that one, and now I've handled this one. The point is, and I think when we talk about, we we use words carefully uh, chosen to kind of push people in a certain way. And we say, was he conscious? Was he delirious? And I think when you read the more medically oriented explanations of this case, what they show is, hey, there is no way on earth this guy should be having these kind of experiences that he reported, given his medical condition. You want to talk about it, coma, conscious, delirious, whatever. His brain was gone, man. There was, as he said, as Dr. Alexander said in that piece that I wrote you, there is no possible way that there could have been any significant mental processing, brain processing going on when that brain state was that. So I think it's disingenuous to kind of when these guys throw around these terms and try and wordsmith it here or there, pick the words apart. It, it, the guy had a severely, severely compromised brain. That isn't even controversial. Why isn't that the focus? Right. And um, I go into, in my article, go into talking about coma and seizures. He was having seizures, and, that, and that's, that's why he was thrashing around, because the electrical activity in his brain being under attack from the bacteria on the surface of the cortex was causing all kinds of uh, random showers of electrical activity that would cause muscle movements, ra- random muscle movements, and, and could cause uh, vocalizations and so on. And, and that's what was observed. Also, the other aspects of his coma were measured, and, and he, was, he, he had severe brain damage from the beginning. Uh, he was in a, a Glasgow coma scale of eight, uh, indicating severe brain damage, and not responsive, maybe responsive if you, if, to a painful stimulus, but not responsive, you know, to talking, not being verbal at all, being unconscious. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and as, as the days wore on, it got worse and worse. And, and towards the end, his hands were curling up and um, his feet were, toes were curling up, and that's indicating even further into coma. So 
to say, well, he was conscious when he was brought out of sedation, uh, or but just delirious, is just completely wrong. You know, and we may never be able to get to the bottom of this. These medical records are very hard to get your hands on. There's privacy issues. There's all sorts of medical liability issues and those kind of things. But one, one final point on your article that we can wrap our arms around because it's very public is Dietrich's spin on Eben Alexander's encounter with the Dalai Lama. And for anyone who really wants a, a fact-based analysis of how straight this guy is shooting with you, can go watch Dr. Alexander's joint presentation with the Dalai Lama. So Dietrich really adds that as the capstone kicker to his article, and you cover it at the end of yours. Tell us what you found out in that case, Robert. Well, Luke Dietrich took the words of the Dalai Lama and twisted them to mean exactly the opposite of what the Dalai Lama meant. And, uh, and not only that, but this was um, emblazoned in the article uh, in a pull quote, all caps, the Dalai Lama wags a finger at Alexander when a, and says, when a man makes extraordinary claims, uh, a thorough investigation is required to ensure that person is reliable, has no reason to lie. You know what I thought was what struck me immediately is as if Dietrich is signing on to this idea that the Dalai Lama has some psychic powers and is reading the soul of even Alexander and is telling this great deceit that he's holding on his soul. I mean, otherwise, well, how would he even, how is he even suggesting that the Dalai Lama would would know what he's suggesting he's saying, which is, of course, gets to the heart of the issue, which is that's not at all what the Dalai Lama was saying. And the whole purpose of that presentation was exactly the opposite of what we're led to believe in the Esquire article. So please elaborate on that. Well, the Dalai Lama heard Eben Alexander's presentation, and the first thing that he said was, your explanation on the basis of your own sort of experience, quite, and then he said a Tibetan word, quite, that word amazing quite amazing and if you look at the if you look at the video it, the Dalai Lama has an expression where he is really quite amazed and that's at the very beginning that's the first thing he said so that kind of tells you well he's not he's not doing he's not making the judgment that Luke Dietrich is saying he's making and the Dalai Lama then explains something about uh, how you can have evident phenomena you can have hidden phenomena that you can infer from measurements, uh, indirect measurements, and then you can have extremely hidden phenomena. And let me just interject one more time, because if you really, if someone really listens to the entire presentation by the Dalai Lama and also puts it in the context of his previous presentations, we should be, it should be crystal clear what he's saying there. He's doing a call to science to investigate consciousness and investigate these phenomena. He is calling out science in exactly the opposite way that Dietrich is talking about. He's saying, hey, get in this game. There's a lot to be investigated here, like this guy has investigated. And his is just one way to investigate it. Right. And, and so he's saying that with these extremely hidden phenomena where you cannot uh, investigate them directly or even indirectly uh, through scientific means, normal scientific means, then you have to rely on the testimony of a person who uh, is, uh, has, has the testimony, who had ex experienced this. But you have to be careful. You have to have a thorough investigation. You have to be sure that the person is reliable and is not, never telling lie. And, and, um, and then you can take the testimony to be credible. And what Luke Dietrich left out was, the Dalai Lama said, and I'm quoting him here, through then thorough investigation, that person is reliable, never telling lie. And in this particular case, this is no reason to tell lie. Therefore, and then the translator says, so then one can take the testimony to be credible. And Luke Dietrich left out that, and in this particular case, this is no reason to tell lie. So he's saying, and in this particular case, 
Eben Alexander, there is no reason to tell a lie. And, uh, and Luke Dietrich turns that around and says, uh, you know, that person is reliable, never telling lie, and has no reason to lie, but leaves out that uh, the Dalai Lama is saying, in this particular case, Eben Alexander has no reason to lie. Right. I mean, obviously, what he's talking about is, again, he's trying to lay the, the cookie crumbs for science in terms of how to investigate it, which you're saying, why should a spiritual leader be doing that? But on the other hand, why hasn't science done a better job of that? So I think he feels motivated to do this. And I think what he's really contrasting is somebody who just walks in off the street and writes a story about a near-death experience they had 20 years ago. We have no way of knowing, versus in this case, we have tons of evidence. It's like I was in the hospital. We have all these medical records. I, I, I think, as you just pointed out, I think that's what the Dalai Lama is alluding to. He's saying, hey, in this case, we have all this evidence. We know this guy is telling the truth about his medical condition. Right, but also that we can rely on his testimony, that is to say what he experienced in, in this transcendent kind of experience, that's reliable, that's credible. Right. And that, that you need to take that, and, and by the way, uh, this is exactly what we, we uh, pr- um, promote as well, that we, you know, that the evidence, even in the transcendent aspects of, of near-death experiences, is valid, and, and actually there's the veridical uh, evidence there as well um, that can be traced back to, you know, facts on the ground, facts on the earth. And so the, the Dalai Lama is, is saying that for these, these experiences, we have to be sure that we're talking to somebody who's not making it up, but then we, can, then we need to study that. Exactly. So, Robert, what has been the reaction so far to the article you've published on the IANS website? Uh, not, not very much. Uh, there have been a number of well, several people uh, who have written blogs that say, yes, this is, uh, you know, certainly certainly destroying uh, Luke Dittrich's uh, credibility, but there has been no contact inquiries from the press. I've sent out a few few uh, emails to um, people who have written articles about Luke Dittrich's article, and uh, n- no response. Right, that's to be expected. I should mention that I did try to contact both the editor of Esquire, David Granger, and Luke Dietrich. Luke Dietrich got back to me with a very quick email saying that he respectfully declined the interview, to which I said, well, great, well, you know, no problem. Why don't I just send you five or six questions and you can do an email response? And I've yet to hear from him, and I never will, never will hear from him uh, on that. So I think this is also, you know, you talked at the very beginning, Robert, about this pattern that we see over and over again. And one of the patterns is, you know, attack the individual, attack the individual cases. Don't ever look at the research as a whole. Don't ever look at, you know, when Jeff Long comes out, Dr. Jeff Long, and compiles hundreds and hundreds of these cases and does statistical analysis. Ah, don't attack that too much. It's going to be kind of hard to hit on hundreds of cases. Instead, just try and knock down these individual cases. Well, another strategy, I think, is get the story out there and then never respond because the follow-up story never gets the traction that the first story gets. Right. But in a way, if the skeptics have got their catchphrase, about Eben Alexander now. And whenever that catchphrase is brought up, then uh, my article can be used as a counter. At least there's that. And hopefully people who really want to investigate and really do want to nudge a little bit closer to the truth, whatever that means to them, can follow the path because it's really not up to us or anyone else to convince someone or try and win them over. All we can do are lay the data out there and let people have their own journey through it. And to that extent, you and Suzanne have done a great service, I think, in both upping the ante internal in terms of journalistic integrity and maybe exposing the larger picture of what's going on with this culture war battle about 
consciousness and survival of consciousness, which is really what's at the heart of this whole thing. Well, great work. Thanks again so much for this article. We'll be sure to post it along with a link to your excellent website where people can check out many of your other uh, interesting presentations. You have some great YouTube presentations that you've done, as well as the writing that you and Suzanne have done. So we'll be sure to mention that. Is there anything else we should mention? Well, no, other than that I'm planning, uh, Suzanne and I are going to be presenting a workshop at the IANS conference uh, in a week. Where is that at? That's in Arlington, Virginia, at the Sheraton Crystal City Hotel, and um, on August 30th, uh, and we're talking about the, the solving the mystery of consciousness through near-death experiences. And, and we're hoping that, I mean, we have another researcher, uh, Kenny Arnett, who is going to be uh, presenting with us, and uh, we're hoping maybe that uh, uh, Evan Alexander, who will be at the conference, uh, will at least uh, come in and, and join the discussion, uh, if not actually to present part of it. Um, we've asked him that, and hopefully he can do that. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, that's uh, if anybody's interested in that, uh, they can get the information on uh, the IANS website, IANS.org. Well, great. And we'll try and link people up to that as well, Robert. Well, it's been great talking to you. And again, congratulations on this excellent work that you've done. Thanks again so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks again to Robert for joining me on Skeptico. And thanks, of course, to both Robert and Suzanne for spending their time and applying their talents to doing this kind of investigation. You know, again, folks, step back. These people aren't paid. They're not, they're not receiving any financial gain for, for doing all this. They're doing it because they have an interest in pursuing the truth, and that is indeed admirable. One question to tee up from this interview, and it's the obvious one. What drives this information war with regard to near-death experience science? Because it's really a one-sided war. I mean, there's a lot of information wars out there. There's a lot of culture battles around different areas of science. There's evolution and intelligent design. There's climate science debates. There's all sorts of debates around science. And they often have two different sides, two different forces that are driving them. In this, there's really only one force. And that's the anti-near-death experience science people. The near-death experience science people aren't driven by some political or religious group or some agenda. They're just people that have pursued an interesting phenomenon. This has huge implications for defining who we are. Let's pursue it. It's really unique, I think, in that way, if you look at it. Of course, you might feel differently about that, in which case that's another reason to answer this question and explain why you do see it differently. If, of course, the place to answer this question, to engage in this dialogue, is through the Skeptico website at skeptiko.com. There you can leave a comment right on the website or click on over to the forum and join the discussion over there. Of course, you can drop me an email or connect with me on Facebook as well. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. A number of interesting shows coming up. We have one more in-your-face kind of skeptical debate that we have to get through because I did a bunch of them all in a row. And then we'll be moving on to other topics. So do stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now.